Minimalism is about identifying what is essential in your life and having the courage to eliminate the rest. Question for you. How much does your environment, your kitchen setup, your digital setup, even the people in your life enable the bad habits you want to break? If you're like me, you've tried hiding ice cream behind all the healthy stuff. You've tried keeping your gym clothes ready for a morning workout. You've installed app blockers to stop scrolling social media late into the night. These work great for a few days, and then inevitably the snacks are in front again, you forgot to put gym clothes out, and the app blocker has been disabled. And yet studies show a good environment is the secret to losing weight. Researchers recruited two groups of people, those who were good at meeting their goals like eating healthy, while the other group was not. All participants were asked throughout their day if they had just faced a temptation. Surprisingly, the researchers found that the successful group faced temptations way less than the unsuccessful group. This then begs the question, how do successful people set up their environment to make healthy habits the default choice and keep it that way forever? There are many, many tips out there, but in my years of trialing and erroring, I found they all boil down to these three principles of minimalism that make weight loss 10 times easier and faster. The first principle is create space. It stems from this code. Minimalism is not a lack of something. It's simply the perfect amount of something. What is the perfect amount of food to lose weight? Is it determined by calories, macros, or food groups? Minimalism's answer is it's determined by the purpose of the food. When I was losing weight, the main purpose of food was relief. If I started a difficult task, I'd feel a craving to snack on chips. This makes sense because every time we eat, we release dopamine, which is the feel-good chemical. This also means that if instead the task was boring, I'd still crave chips, but this time as relief from boredom. And then, of course, if I was exhausted or overwhelmed by the end of my day, I'd want pizza with TV as both relief and celebration. To be honest, I felt I deserved it on those days. Celebration with food also happened if I finished a difficult task. The weekends were celebration extravaganza with brunch mimosas, eggs, potatoes, and toast. And of course, how could I meet friends without eating together? Food was the backbone of connecting with each other. But if the purpose of all my food choices is relief, celebration, and connection, why would I ever want the opposite? Who wants stress, misery, and disconnection? The problem was I never created space to decide on the purpose of my food. And by space, I mean literal space. I changed the organization of my kitchen in three ways. First, I took out all foods in my kitchen and grouped them into three categories, relief, celebration slash connection, and fuel. So for example, for me, chips went into relief, pizza into celebration slash connection, and oats went into the fuel category. Honestly, I ended up throwing out 90% of the foods in the non-fuel categories after doing this exercise. Then stealing a trick from supermarkets, I put the fuel category of foods at eye level and up, while for others, I'd have to look down and crouch to get them out. I also ordered the non-fuel category foods to go from the least unhealthy option in front to the unhealthiest in the back. And most importantly, I stuck on each shelf the purpose of the food prominently. So if I was reaching for chips, I'd see the relief note, and this would create the space for me to think, is this how I want relief right now? And if the answer was no, I'd go talk to a coworker or drink water instead to find relief. The second organization change was I upfront decided the containers in which I would eat foods from each category. Fuel and celebration slash connection had one US cup size bowls, I don't like using plates, while relief was half a cup. After the bowl was empty, I couldn't get more until after my next meal. And last organizational change was my grocery list was organized around these categories. It gave me awareness of how many foods I was buying for fuel versus other reasons. This awareness helped about half the time, but sometimes I really wanted relief or to celebrate, so I'd ignore the notes or skip the bowl for the entire bag of chips. And yet I'd end those days with regret over how I ate. I realized that creating space was the last line of defense against regrettable days. I had to go one step earlier to the moment I got the urge to eat in the first place. And if I could reduce the urge by half, then I'd have cut my bad habits by 75%. The last two minimalism principles help with this. The first of which is embrace space. If you're like me, then you reach for your phone the second your dinner partner leaves for the bathroom, or you're sitting and thinking about a work task and need to eat or drink something at the same time. Or if you're eating alone, it must be with TV or a podcast. I sometimes find it hard to even get out of bed without music or a podcast to listen to. I carry my phone with me from room to room like a lifeline. Embracing empty spaces in life where there isn't constant novelty thrown at us is very hard. And yet that's the reason why we lose our connection with our satiety. My application of this principle is best described as one space, one use. This is how I divide my spaces. I have my TV only in the living room and while I watch, I do not eat. I can drink water, but that's it. This stops me from mindlessly eating. 
The kitchen and dining area is for cooking and eating only. I allow myself to listen to a podcast or audiobook or music, but not look at anything. Our vision consumes half of our brain capacity and nearly 10 million out of 11 million sensory receptors are dedicated to vision. Seeing something literally hijacks us. So I keep in touch with my satiety by only listening. I have my full desk set up for work I don't have trouble starting, which is everything analytical for me. But for work I tend to procrastinate on, like writing these videos, I do them on my iPad because it significantly limits distractions by not supporting any of my work apps and loading many websites poorly. If I find myself procrastinating on analytical work, I move to the table in my living room and try starting it on my Chromebook. Studies confirm my experience. A change in space, whether it be between devices or rooms, gives our brains a mental energy boost. This keeps me on top of my work, so I don't end the day stressed and looking to food for relief. In the bedroom, I keep my Kindle and near dumb phone, which only has Audible on it for listening to fiction audiobooks while waiting to get drowsy. I don't scroll social media or entertain myself on my phone in bed. This helped me fall asleep on time. And good sleep means 50% less cravings and hunger and 33 to 55% higher metabolism the next day compared to if I slept poorly. I have a table with my phone chargers and I can only scroll social media while sitting there. I also have an app blocker installed which shuts me out of social media after a fixed time of use. Again, this is super helpful in sending me to bed on time. The second way to reduce the urge to eat out of relief or hurdle down the highway of bad habits is to follow the third minimalism principle, eliminate distractions. Think about it. I start eating pizza and even though I am full, I keep eating. Or I'm scrolling social media at night, my app blocker blocks me, but then I override it almost mindlessly because I really want to finish reading what I'm reading. Or it could be the opposite where my momentum is broken instead. I decide to go to the gym in the morning, but when I wake up, I'm faced with numerous tiny decisions like finding my gym clothes and deciding which workout to do once I get there. So I decide to do it tomorrow. It's like life is full of on-ramps to different habit highways. Once we get on one, it's really hard to stop. And we tend to pick whichever on-ramp is easiest. This means both in front of us and fastest to get on. So the best way to stop getting onto undesirable habit highways is to eliminate their on-ramps from being in front of us and to make them hard to get onto, that is to eliminate these distractions. For each pillar of weight loss, I do two things. For food, I tend to eat packaged snacks for relief. So to eliminate this on-ramp, I limited how many snacks I bought to be one less box every month. Until three years later till now, I keep only a bar of chocolate at home. I'm only allowed to do grocery runs once a week, so if I finish the bar early, that's that, until the next grocery run. Finally, I have a separate bank account just for restaurant spending, and once I'm out of money, I'm out until my next scheduled transfer next month. For exercise, I have my gym bag always ready, overnight oats batch made for the week in the fridge, and I sleep in my gym clothes so I can pop out of bed in the morning and be out the door in 15 minutes. Despite knowing myself how to program workouts, this is a cognitive load that makes getting onto the exercise on-ramp harder because I have to plan, think, adjust. I used to take pride in, I can plan super effective workouts myself, but this fake pride makes getting on the exercise on-ramp unnecessarily slow and hard. So I've outsourced my workout planning to an online trainer. For sleep, a big factor is stopping work on time, so I have enough time to wind down before bed. I pay ahead of time for evening classes and climbing or commit to a walk with friends to hold myself accountable to stopping on time. I have an outlet timer which turns off the router at 8 p.m. This introduces an easy off-ramp from scrolling social media even more so than app blockers do. Sleep is in fact a huge invisible hand affecting our eating, motivation for exercise, and metabolism. But with screens the main way to relax at night, I struggled with sleeping before midnight. This is why you don't want to ignore this video where I explain the simple three-part ritual for amazing sleep that I discovered after years of trial and errors. Each day of good sleep was a day of higher metabolism, lower hunger and cravings, and 500% easier time losing weight. So you don't want to miss the complete step-by-step -step breakdown here. And always remember, you can do it.